okay up to here is your new lesson. Although, since this lesson had the assignment of doing the carpet uh, design, I don't think that there's going to be exactly an assignment at the end of this, but there will be a request that you gather some materials, and we'll get to that at the end. But first, some corrections, because some of the things that I've told you turn out to be wrong, and I hate to have uh, told you things uh, that you um, assume are information and then turns out to be incorrect, so I have to make some corrections. The first correction has to do with the woman who shot Andy Warhol that we were talking about, or that I was talking about, I don't know if you're interested in it or not. But her name was Valerie Solano. I said, here's what I said. I said that Valerie shot Andy Warhol three times. That's not exactly true. She shot at him three times, but only one bullet hit him. Um, that did a lot of damage, and it took him a long time to recover, but it was one bullet and not three. The second thing I said was that Andy Warhol did not press charges and that she did not go to prison. That is not correct. Um, he did not press charges, but she was tried for attempted murder, and she was convicted. And it says here that um, uh, she turned herself in. She was charged with attempted murder, assault, illegal possession of a gun. She was di diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and after that spent a lot of time in both prison and mental hospitals. Her, she served three-year prison sentence, but also in a psychiatric hospital. Now, when I was there, we talked about, or I talked about schizophrenia, but I'm not going to go into that now. Perhaps you remember what I said. The second thing is this. I said that Gogol, when he wrote The Nose, was either the first or one of the very first writers to introduce the idea of an insignificant person as the main character of a novel. Now, that is generally in the ballpark, but specifically, when I was talking about um, Victor Hugo, I looked up Victor Hugo and I discovered that what, what the biography said about him was that his main characters in uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame are poor people, gypsies, uh, 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 thieves, uh, ugly people, hunchback, in other words, Victor Hugo wrote about the poor as his main characters. Now, when was The Hunchback of Notre Dame written? It was written in 1831. When was The Nose written? 1835 and 1836. You're very familiar with the writer Charles Dickens, who also used poor, insignificant people uh, as his main characters. One of the most famous works of Dickens is Oliver Twist. When was Oliver Twist written? Oliver Twist was written in 1837. So you see, in just a matter of a very few years, uh, there was this blooming of, of literature, novels, about insignificant people. Oliver Twist is an orphan, and it begins in uh, the... Uh, the um, labor house where he is at the age of nine, ten years old, put to work. Very interestingly, very similar thing happened to Charles Dickens himself, which because when he was twelve, he was basically <clears throat> abandoned by his family, who went to live in prison with his father, and he remained at twelve years old in a boarding house and worked in a, in a factory making. I think shoe shine material, uh, blacking. Um, this is part of the reason if you read anything of Dickens, you realize that his descriptions of poverty, of uh, a crime, of disease, of slums, is all very accurate because he experienced it and he was able to write about it. Now, all that has nothing to do with your assignment or with art, as, as, uh, as, but. Even so, I don't care. I just want to clear up these incorrect information. So, uh, literature about insignificant people begins with Victor Hugo and not with uh, uh, any of the Russian writers. One last thing. Did the Russian writers, were they able to read Victor Hugo 
because it was in French. Yes, the answer is yes, because the, the uh, Russians all spoke French as their, the, the educated Russians spoke French as their first language and Russian as their second language, and that included the Tsar and his court. They all spoke French, read, and could converse in French because I guess what they said was it was a superior culture to their own, and so they looked down on their own language and their own literary traditions. Now, what this? This is this is a leftover from last week when I wanted to talk about interior design, and I'll make it quick. The idea that I want to express is this: this is the kind of interior in which no color is used. It's very timid. It's very uh, 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 like cautious. It uses only like there's this, 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 and this. And every single picture shows an interior where the designer very timidly does not use anything as strong. Like in this picture, the strongest color in this picture is some red flowers on a on a uh, table in the corner. The strongest color in this picture is a little red. It's a basketball on the floor. And that's it. And there's a little maroon shade of something over here in the corner. Now, in this one, we have fruit. That's color. And look, they put hearts in the window. Isn't that nice? But the designer of that space said, like, this is going to just be beige. Tan, black, brown, and white. And you described this, too. You said yourself. You said, the people who do the interior design for the condos that are sold for people who who just come up here once in a while, look like this. Now, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is this. Here, now the difference between that and this is that you know for certain someone with a very serious personality lives in this place. We, I don't know who it is, it's from a magazine. Probably some famous person. They use every possible color that they can possibly get their hands on, but, but, but it's not garish. Every single color is thought about and balanced to all. It's not any pink, it's not any orange, it's not any blue, but it's very specifically selected so that in the end result is not a painting, a painting, a painting, a, a, a pot on a shelf. It's an entire room that's become a painting. Now, I ask you this question. What is your interior like that you live with? It is in this category, obviously, and not in the other category. And that brings me to my assignment. My sister's house has a work of art that whenever I visit her, I'm going to visit her on Thanksgiving, always pops out and I always go and look at it. And I always say to my sister, I always say, Romy, who did this? And Romy says to me, I told you a thousand times. It was done by, a, a, I think, I don't even remember. I have to ask her again this Thanksgiving for the tenth time who did it. But what it is, is what sticks in my mind, which is a collage made up of paper, which is the color samples from a paint store. Somebody, I think probably one of her two daughters, went to the hardware store and got like 20 or 30 of those little color chips and sat down and assembled them in a, in a grid of five by five so that it makes like a checkerboard of all different tints. And every time I'm at the house, I look at that and I think, that was probably an art assignment that was given to his daughter years, to their daughter years ago. And here it is in a frame on a mantle. And every time I go there, it jumps up. So that brings me back to this. Once in a while you'll see in a room like this something and you just can't take your eyes off it. And so I thought if ever I get the chance I'm going to ask an art student that I'm teaching to make a collage out of um, color samples from the hardware store. So these are color samples from the hardware store. I got them an hour ago from Car Hardware. You can go in the hardware store and you can take any number of these and often they're very interesting colors and you can put them all together. So your assignment is not to make a collage. Your assignment is to go to the hardware store, 
collect a whole bunch of these, at least like 30 or 40 of them, all different sizes and shapes, and bring them home, and then think about how you're going to arrange them into a, a collage. And my job will be to make a frame for it so that it can go on somebody's mantle and never be forgotten about who did it and why. And that is your assignment for this week.